Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, thanks, Rachel, for providing an introduction to the talk. I, I have to admit, I wasn't quite sure how this connects to decentralization, but now I know. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to talk to you today about my uh, work on labor market concentration around uh, power in the labor market and uh, its legal implications. So I'm Joanna Vargas from the University of Pennsylvania and, uh, and Leo. So, all right, so how to think about uh, pop, uh, labor market concentration? So I think many of you in this room are familiar with the idea of product market concentration. So, you know, product market is concentrated <laughs> if just a few companies realize most of the sales in a certain domain. So, for example, mobile telecom in the U.S. is quite concentrated, dominated by roughly four big companies. So, uh, similarly, if you think about the labor market, uh, you can think that labor market is concentrated now in just a few employers hold a certain category of jobs. So that's, that's the fundamental idea here. And economic theory uh, predicts that product market concentration, which an extreme form of that is monopoly, when literally there's only one producer, increases prices, but also uh, labor market concentration for the same reason, the extreme case being a monopsony, where literally there's only one employer for that kind of labor, decreases wages for exactly the same theoretical reasons why a monopoly uh, increases prices. So um, one way to measure concentration, which is consistent with a Cournot model of competition, is through this thing called the hirschfeld hirschberg index. And so this can be applied to the product or labor market. And essentially, it is simply the sum of the square market shares of each uh, participant. So in the, because I talk about the labor market, this uh, market share here is going to be the market share of a firm J's vacancies in some market M. So you know, uh, I'm going to talk to you about some examples in a moment. Uh, about how uh, this works, but it could be, you know, the share of Java programmers that a certain tech company, uh, you know, is currently advertising in the in the Bay Area. Let's say that might be uh, that might be an example. And so, if there's a lot of tech companies uh, hiring Java programmers, this HHI index is going to be very small. Uh, if there's just a few, a small uh, number of companies is going to be bigger. In the extreme, if there's just one company, this is one, so the index is 10,000 uh, HHI. That's the most concentrated in monopsony. So only one uh, employer in that market. So why focus on the HHI? Uh, obviously, there's other ways that you could measure market power or concentration. And so one of the reasons why I decided to focus on this particular measure, uh, I'm in a policy school, is because of its policy importance. It turns out that from a legal perspective, this HHI index is highly significant uh, because it plays a role in antitrust enforcement. So the antitrust federal agencies, which is the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission, have a document called the Horizontal Merger Guidelines. And this explains what kind of mergers can or cannot be authorized by these antitrust authorities. Crucially, in order to authorize a merger or not, they're going to look at the HHI, this concentration index, as one of the key elements to make that decision. And this is why I chose to focus on that particular measure. So, uh, and they have some guidelines that say that an HHI above 1,500 is moderately concentrated, and an HHI above 2,500 is highly concentrated. Now, just to fix ideas, you probably remember the formula, but just 2,500, that is a case where you have four market participants with equal shares, is 2,500. So anything more concentrated than that, with more lopsided shares of fewer participants, is going to have an even higher uh, age uh, So that's what I just said. So importantly, from a legal perspective, an enforcement perspective, if you have a merger between two companies, uh, that increases the HHI by more than 200 points and leads to a highly concentrated market, this merger is presumed likely to increase market power. So that means that there's a red flag and this merger is likely to be blocked by the antitrust authorities. I should say just for everyone that there's also thresholds, so they only look at bigger companies' mergers, but then if it satisfies this criterion, then it's quite likely that the merger is going to be blocked because 
there's a presumption that, and you know, legally a presumption means that's our prior. Then the companies can fight it and prove that it's not going to lead to anti-competitive effects. That's why we call it a presumption. Most companies are not very successful in making their case. So like, you know, this is a, a, something that would count against the merger. And what's really uh, critical here is that the same HHI threshold applies both to the seller or the buyer. So, uh, you know, the case that we're usually looking at in antitrust is seller side, so that'd be the telecom market when I'm selling you a telecom service, that's the classic case. But what I want to talk today is buyer power. So a buyer that has market power over uh, the sellers that are under them. And so this is the example of the labor market. If you think about employer power, that's the power of a, of a buyer over sellers on the part here, the, the sellers of labor. And so uh, therefore, it is uh, appropriate to, the, to think about labor market HHI and then potentially leading to the conclusion that mergers between two companies that significantly increase labor market concentration should be blocked. And in fact, it is within uh, the uh, horizontal merger guidelines to have this, but it hasn't happened yet. Uh, so, you know, uh, I'll t tell you more about this in a moment. So, uh, basically, we uh, did this work where we defined the labor market by a combination of an occupation. So, because you have to define what kind of job, right? So, I gave the example of software engineer. Obviously, you know, software engineer is one kind of job, there's other kinds of jobs, so we have to say what kind of job we're talking about. A commuting zone, so which is an area where people commute and work, and a quarter. So you want to define the time frame, because when you think about someone who's unemployed, they only have a limited time to find a job. <coughs> so the average duration of unemployment is about a quarter, and so the idea is, sure, another company might advertise a job next year, but if I'm unemployed today, that job you know, isn't relevant in my, choice, in my even potential choice. So we have to think about, within some reasonable range of time, what is the typical number of companies that are actually playing in this market and trying to uh, recruit workers. So um, then an example of this uh, would be accountants and auditors in New York City. This is one uh, SOC code, six digits. So technically, this is what we're using in New York City. Uh, in the first quarter of 2016. I'm happy to talk more about why this was chosen, but just briefly to tell you, you might think that this category is too broad or too narrow. We argue that for most professions, it's probably too broad. For example, accountants is actually a different kind of uh, activity than auditors. They're similar, but different in many, in many ways. And what is going to be critical in terms of thinking about how to define a job type that is relevant for antitrust analysis is to think about how vulnerable workers are to wage suppression. So if a job type is such that even if your wage were suppressed, you wouldn't be willing to go to the next job, or not enough people would be. So the point is not that no one would quit. But if it's easy to cut wages and have many people stay on because the next best alternative isn't good enough because that's not the kind of job that you've been trained for, then a potential monopsonist, right, so an employer that has labor market power, can profitably suppress wages. So that's the way to think about this. It's not to think that no worker will ever switch occupations. The critical question is, could a monopsonist suppress wages and still have enough people stay on that the operation is profitable uh, on balance? It's just the same way as the monopolist, right? So the monopolist will jack up prices. Sure, they're going to lose some customers, but they make enough profit on the remaining ones to make this operation profitable. So that's also the way to think about the monopsonist suppresses wages and loses some workers, sure, but is this on balance a profitable uh, operation? So this is the first uh, result I want to show you. So in one of our papers uh, with uh, Azar, Steinberg, and Task in 2018, we use this data set from Burning Glass Technologies that is from 2016 and has all jobs in the US that are posted online. And uh, we calculate concentration uh, in all uh, US uh, commuting zones. And so what we find is that 60% uh, of US labor markets overall, not just commuting zones, but you know the way we define it. So commuting zone by occupation by quarter, overall 60% of this cells are highly concentrated. 
And then when you look at the map, it kind of reflects this. You see that most zones are orange or red, which are highly concentrated. You also note that there are green zones, and these green zones, like here we are in the East Coast Corridor, tend to uh, be in places that have high population density, which is kind of what we expect of a competitive market, as many buyers and sellers, and this is what you see. So of course, uh, it will be the case that a lot of the 60% uh, of the markets are pretty low population density, and actually this 60% of markets represent about 20% of US employment. Again, because they tend to be in smaller places. So, you know, it's, uh, the concentration is very high on average, but of course it's, you know, skewed towards less densely populated uh, areas. So that's the first result. And then the question is, remember, okay, concentration is a measure of market power, but do employers take advantage of this to suppress wages? So then we look at the relationship statistically between concentration and wages. And so we use this, uh, in this other paper with uh, Jose Azar and Marshall Steinbaum, we use data from careerbullet.com, which has about a, a third of all vacancies, but it has higher quality uh, data for a number of reasons I don't want to uh, get into right now. So this graph shows you just the uh, raw correlation between concentration and wage. So this, this doesn't account for any you know, potential confounds, it just shows you the correlation. So what you see here is that the higher the concentration and the lower the wages tend to be on average uh, in this data set uh, across markets. And so, of course, this could be linked, for example, to the fact that less densely populated areas maybe have lower wages because cost of living is lower, etc. So that's why uh, we uh, you know, do a much more uh, controlled statistical analysis where, in, in essence, our identification strategy is to look at when concentration increases within one of those markets. So the concentration of accountants and auditors in New York City goes up. How do the wages of accountants and auditors react? And these are all posted wages. So these are the wages that firms advertise online. So, what we find uh, after controlling for a bunch of factors, and it's all a panel within regression, is that a 10% higher concentration is associated with about 0.4% to 1.5% uh, lower posted wages. And we also have an instrumental variable strategy for those who do econ in here, and so that's sort of what we find with our IV, and this is the OLS, but that's sort of the range of effect that, uh, that we have here. So, <coughs> This, uh, this has uh, led to uh, some uh, interesting press coverage. Why is pay lagging? Maybe too many mergers in the heartland. So we've seen all that red zone in the middle of the country. And so they have a really uh, interesting tale about uh, um, uh, fair, uh, repair, repair farm equipment. Again, repairs farm equipment. That's one of the most concentrated occupations in the country. In a way, not surprising, right? It's like a rural. Uh, kind of occupation and how actually there's been an increase in concentration in Wisconsin to tell the tale of this guy who doesn't want to work for the big company and then is unable to find another job uh, with, a, uh, with a smaller company. So, uh, you know, this was my, uh, my first paper here, but you know, you might uh, think that there are some limitations to this analysis and for one thing, sure, we have an IV, but you know, I, I will readily confess it's not a perfect experiment. So you know, people have been interested in this topic, and so there's a whole literature that has done similar analysis uh, with different data sets, slightly different market definition, and so on. So they all find six papers, a negative relationship between uh, concentration and wages, and each paper can control for slightly different things. Nevertheless, the relationship survives. I think one of the most interesting papers that's uh, come out of this literature, we talked about mergers. That's in a way a more credible experiment uh, or you know, better way to identify the impact of concentration on wages. And so what uh, Preja and Schmidt show is that hospital mergers, so okay, hospitals is like a well-known uh, issue of potentially concentrated markets because they are quite local. So what they show is that hospital mergers reduce the wages of specialized hospital personnel like pharmacists and nurses, but only when labor market concentration increases significantly. 
which validates the idea that labor market concentration matters. So you know, if two hospitals, two small hospitals merge, that doesn't you know change the concentration very much. But when two big hospitals merge, or you know when concentration really changes, that's when you see uh, this uh, wage suppression effect among uh, specialized uh, personnel. And interestingly, they also found no employment effect. So the wage suppression doesn't come because of efficiency gains. Let's say I cut my number of nurses, and that's why I'm paying them less. They kept the same number of people and just paid them less uh, compared to uh, you know, areas where there was no, uh, no merger. And just because someone, uh, you mentioned racial unions, I do want to say that uh, both this paper and a bunch of these papers here have looked at the impact of unions. Uh, or rather how concentration affects wages with or without units. And all of the papers that I've looked at this found that the negative impact of concentration on wages is lessened the more powerful uh, unions are. So that this seems to suggest that indeed there is a market power at play. So, okay, so that's uh, the empirical work in economics. I've also, um, ventured into the legal uh, area, thinking about uh, mergers and beyond in terms of the, uh, what antitrust policy uh, we can have based on this. So in my paper with uh, Herb Hohenkamp at Penn, we discuss uh, how labor market effects can be incorporated in a merger review. So you know, this is all about mergers and the legal uh, you know, issues that a court would face and how we solve you know, every particular uh, issue that uh, comes up. And then I have a more a recent paper that we're finishing up right now with uh, Eric Posner, where we discuss why there has been very little antitrust litigation. And so in, uh, in one of our papers, we go uh, through this and we argue, as I kind of previewed, that it has something to do with the elasticity of labor supply. Uh, meaning, if a, mon a monopsonist was going to suppress wages, how likely is it, or you know, how was the share of workers that would leave to another market? And what we know from this is that most estimates in the literature of this kind of elasticity are very low. And so low that it does seem like the uh, uh, definition that we propose of the six-digit SOC code is probably too broad. In fact, in one of my papers, I look at uh, the uh, jobs posted. And so I look at, do uh, jobs with higher wages get more applicants? And if you just look within an SOC, <laughs> The average relationship is negative. So for example, accountants and auditors, senior accountant jobs get systematically fewer applicants, even though they are paid more than, let's say, you know, junior accountant jobs. So even between junior and senior accountants, these are not the same uh, jobs. So they are quite different people sort according to uh, the exact job title. So that's just one example, but there's many similar types of work showing how uh, you know, these kinds of categories are probably, in many cases, too broad. Now, obviously, we haven't looked at every particular occupation, and that's work in progress that I'm uh, doing with Jose Alzar and Steve Perry at Yale, the way we're going to estimate this kind of elasticity for every six-digit occupation, uh, looking at competition both within market. So if within the market, one firm increases the wage, how much is stealing you know, workers from other firms in the market? And then, if all companies in the market increase the wage, how much are they able to you know, bring in workers from the other market? So we'll be able to you know, say more about that uh, based on our new work. Very yeah. interesting and good work. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering, your 60% of markets that are highly concentrated, I assume was just a simple percentage. If you, if you weighted them by the size of each labor market, you would come out with what percentage of the U.S. labor force is in a highly concentrated 20%. market? 20%. Have you done that? Kind of, what is it? 20%. 20%, thank you. Right. So it's still... So it sounds like since you didn't see an elasticity in the labor supply, there's no clear efficiency effects observed yet here. Can you elaborate? You're not seeing a net efficiency uh, you, you in the labor market. Reducing employment. You're just changing a price, you're not changing a quantity, right? Right, so, so that's very kind of hard. To, there are almost no studies on that. So the only one that is clearly looking at this is the hospital merger. And in that case, there was no change in quantities, only in price, which is actually good for that study. Because if there was a change in quantity, then we might start arguing about so-called efficiency. That maybe you know they cut employment, now they're more efficient, and there's supply and demand going on. 
but we don't have, this is a one study, so we don't know like in general what the quantity effects are, and it's always, and in any credible uh, quasi-experiment is going to do something like a merger, and then it is difficult to disentangle efficiencies, you know, from actual exercises of an obsolete power. So uh, that's, you know, just an inherent empirical. Can you just plug in some standard labor elasticity estimates to get an estimated efficiency effect? Do you, do you, do you believe there's an efficiency loss here? Um, well, we can think more about that. <laughs> yes. Two questions bridging different presentations, if that's okay, or do we have to just go anywhere? Oh, actually, yeah, that's true. Yeah. I should have monopolized the so, since we have. So, yeah. so one, one question that really bridges Joanna and Rachel's presentation that is super important right now for a bunch of policy questions is um, a lot of data is produced at work. The labor, the employment contract between firms and consumers, even if the firms are able to get access to that data as data laborers, <laughs> could have a huge effect on the future of the employment relationship and is currently of a sort that would tend to have a particular incidence uh, for reasons that you want us. It has to do with that as well as behavioral economic things of the works not having any idea that this isn't even an issue. So that I think that's an incredibly important issue and I'm interested in your thoughts about it. The, the other one that I thought was really fascinating, bridging sort of like what Steve was talking about in some of the morning presentations is like, there are those areas where there's a lot of labor market concentration, and then there's those green areas with a lot of population concentration. And in those population concentration areas, we have various forms of property market market power or city ownership market power. So there's sort of a conservation of market power thing going on here, it seems like, where like either it's a locus of a lot of competition and there's market power in the ability to be in that area, or there's not so much concentration and then there's concentration because it's sparse, so I'm going to read a few thoughts about that. Um, so, I'll, so I'll address the first question, um, which is the question of sort of like data being created at work. And you're right, this is especially tricky because like, well, technically, you know, maybe these are just people doing their, their jobs and they are being paid for it, although perhaps generating data falls outside of their job description, and so kind of the legal gray, gray, gray area for that is very fuzzy. Um, one thing that is true is that, is that like um, data tend to be collected more in low wage jobs. Um, think about like um, the kind of employers who might want to monitor employees on closed certain Circuit cameras. They may want to, like you know, monitor every keystroke they type. These are probably not academics and not researchers, but these, but these are probably cashiers working for sort of like you know minimum wage at a convenience store or at a like fast food shop. Um, um, and like the same thing also as we think about about drivers for places like um, Uber and Lyft. They have their location and their driving patterns continuously mo monitored. And we, we all know these are not really high wage jobs. Um, so, so that is definitely true, and it's important um, to kind of ask that both as like a market question, but I think also as like a fairness question and as like an equity question, almost as like a protection for these workers who sort of have, have the less power in trying to market um, Beyond just for their jobs, but also trying, trying, trying to sort of like advocate for their rights in general. Um, probably like a minimum wage worker is not going to be used to like you know advocating for their rights in the workplace, and so this is kind of like an extra importance on top of that market question. I, I was going to comment. I just say a couple things. One, the, the sort of conservation of market power. Another way of putting that is there's a scarce factor everywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is a problem in general. It gets back to the sort of Tao of decentralization issue. Yeah, exactly. In general, whenever people suggest, oh, there's market power in a place, the problem is the, the, the solution is to introduce more competition. Um, in practice, what that usually ends up doing is just changing where the scarce factor is. So as the economy gets efficient in one way, we find a lot of rents going to lawyers, right? Lots of efficiencies. In the rest of the economy, and you know, some professor professions sort of really rise because those are the ones for which there's still network effects that bind. Um, and so, you know, one way to think about this, of, of you know, 
it's a really fascinating suggestion. Rachel's talk of data unions and the, the idea of unions in general is often kind of paradoxically, maybe paradoxically, if you're trying to address the scarce factor, you can't make the scarce factor go away. There's always going to be a scarcest factor, and if you just leave it alone, it's going to accrue a lot of rents. So instead, maybe the thing to do is to create more scarce factors. Right. Although then we're getting into a second best theory, and that's really tricky. I mean, you know, so I'm trying to think about so optimal unions, let's say, <laughs> uh, that aren't going to mess up things uh, is, is, is not a trivial thing. Because you know, fixing market power with more market power on the other side isn't you know, necessarily going to make things better, you know, always. Definitely. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> um, I have a quick question about um, we talk about uh, employment and labor uh, concentration, but what about that for machines? Um, I'm talking uh, specifically not about science, science fiction, but in, say, blockchain. So if you look at every, uh, what is programmatic employment in blockchain? It's called miners. And miners uh, have in, uh, actually elastic supply, and it responds to market wages. So it's actually quite, uh, I will be quite interesting. Actually, I can provide data for that as well to actually run the exact same experiment run on the hospital, uh, as well as um, the effect of potential unionization. Because yeah, market um, we've seen across different um, public blockchains the different level of market concentration and um, how that has affected essentially wages, which is output um, produced earned by the mine people who own the mining returns and different level of market concentration has exhibited across different public chains and that actually has affected um, incentives for people to actually participate in it. I'm interested in it particularly because I think down the road um, with or without blockchain's uh, evolution that we will see more programma programmatic employment and um, um, Mechanic Turk is just the beginning. And, and, okay, that's great. I, mean, I actually don't know a whole lot about blockchain, but that sounds super interesting, so let's talk about it more. I think Steve will probably also have some insights on this. Uh, so I, I'm definitely interested in that. I just wanted to briefly tell everyone that there's been a cool study, and if we could do something like that for blockchain, on Enter. And you know, looking at experiments, wage experiments on Enter, and they found that basically the elasticity of Turkers is almost null. So it's like 0.2, meaning that a 10% increase in wage will get you 2% like water. It's like nothing. And it implies a rate of exploitation that is extreme. That, you know, the, the, the value that the Turkers bring is so much immensely more than what they are getting paid that it's just obscene, you know, sort of difference between the two. Now, there might be many reasons, and people have speculated about, you know, you were telling us about, oh, but people have fun doing it, and so on. And so it could be that Turkers are special, and the reason why they're Turk is, it's not really a job, it's some sort of quasi-leisure, and that's why they don't care about the payment so much. Saying, but, yeah. I But you do not enjoy it, and it does not seem like a fun job. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, the, the finding is that that elasticity is very small, so I'd be really curious to see what it looks like on blockchain. Is there any stability? Uh, yeah, do we still have time? Oh, sorry, I mean, we, can, we can talk about it. Um, Afterwards. We're going to have one more. We have a little break. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I was just uh, following up on the idea that laborers produce data. Um, I was talking recently to a hospital, MGH, about patients producing data. And uh, it's really interesting. The manager of the data at MGH was saying, like, you know, he doesn't know if this data set is a, like, has value or if it's a liability and they should try to eliminate it as much as possible. And they were interested in ways to act as like an intermediary for their patients to sell the data if they want to. Uh, but you know, they can't, have, and they get approached all the time by like Google and whatnot, but they can't sell the data because there's this trust relationship between the hospital and its patients. And if the hospital violates that, that oath, then you know they're going to lose the ability to deliver healthcare to their patients, which is their primary, I guess, business model. And so I just think it's an interesting twist on the data, uh, the personal data and value of data debate. Um, 
which I usually see cast in the uh, electronic framework with like Google and Facebook, but you know, like I can go off of Facebook, but I need I need a hospital event in the day. So um, I just I that's just my comment. All right, um, we have a break for maybe 10 minutes, then we come back for the next session. Yeah, the next session, yeah.